Those of you who weren't here, my name is David. I'm an independent commissioner uh, appointed to chair this particular uh, uh, hearing. And with me is Commissioner... Basil Morrison, uh, independent hearings commissioner. <clears throat> Um, and uh, you will be aware of Julie McKee on my right, on your left on the screen here, who's uh, uh, looking after us today. Um, just a couple of matters before we, before we start with, uh, with Gulf Lands, just to <clears throat> indicate that uh, yesterday we heard uh, submissions generally on both on the uh, general reserve issues, um, on LD 40 foot and Chirakawa Drive, so we've uh, we've dealt with those uh, those submissions, <clears throat> and today solely on golf lands. Um, uh, just in terms of what our brief is, if you like, um, we're appointed to make recommendations back to council on these matters. Um, it will then go to a council committee um, at the stage we're anticipating. That's probably the April committee of the uh, pace Commi committee. Um, and that, that then, when, once that committee decides whether to accept our recommendations or, or not, um, if this matter is to progress any further, that will then go to, to the Council's Finance Committee before it uh, then finds its way to, uh, to the Minister. But a final sign off if, in actual fact, any of these reserves are, um, are progressed to a point of revocation and disposal. Uh, so that's that's our brief. Our brief here is not to determine the matters, but simply to make a recommendation based on the submissions that we hear. All right, so we're in the hands then of uh, um, Mr. Is it Mr. Desai or, or who are we? Uh, who are we? You, you can call us Mr. Desai. <laughs> yeah. um, and Julie, do you want us to start the presentation or you want to have control over that? Um, it's up to you. Um, okay. If you wish to share it, that's perfectly fine. Okay, I'll, I'll I, do I'm that. Happy to do it if you want. Yeah, let's see if it works, or else I'll ask you to do that. Eh? And um, okay. Um, so here we go. I'll share the screen. Just whilst we're doing that, I'll also mention that uh, um, the commissioners will do site visits around the uh, reserves that we're considering on Monday, so you may see us in the vicinity. If you do, don't come up to us and say anything. It gives away, by all means, um, but uh, <coughs> um, keep your distance, basically. Right. Well, there. Um, <clears throat> basically, um, let me just say, you know, good morning, Kiora, hello to the hearing commissioners, Mr. Hill. Mr. Morrison, uh, our respective councillors and officials who are there from Panuku. And just to explain that, we just to make it clear, we've got 10 slides basically. I'll be going through slides one to six, and then Neil Pinkerton will do slides seven, eight, nine, then I'll come back for the last slide 10. And we should finish all of that off within 30 to 40 minutes, even earlier probably. And within those slides, the volunteers, which is the four main families, um, you know, myself, Neil, John Mooney, undersigned on this document, um, screen in front of you, Roger and Angela. Uh, we, we are there, we are the basic volunteers, then we've got other volunteers. Um, so basically, we are representing Golflands. We have had over 210 individual objections and submissions to the Auckland Council. And this is all within the Golflands area. And I'm going to harp on that why it's important to just be within our area. Uh, our group itself represents 156 of these submitters, including the speakers at this hearing, which is our four speakers mentioned below. Um, and then, of course, we've got five individual speakers. Uh, Julie, uh, the last speaker, Terry Brunton, he uh, has requested that he'll sit with us, so he's there. So right now I've got about seven people with us. And they are sort of the volunteers as well. And we have just to be clear, just to be clear on health and safety perspective, we all vaccinated, and we are all keeping our social distance the best we can. Um, and outside of that, we had actually before the submission started, we had about hundred and sorry, four hundred and seventy households that signed up a petition, all within golf golflands as well. Now, before I start, I just want to give you a little little background. Um, firstly, um, I want to thank Julie as well. I think this has been a reasonable, um, emotional sort of process for at least the Golfland residents. 
and I think she's handled it pretty good. Um, and, and the amount of submissions that have been handled. So thank you for that. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, basically, um, uh, <clears throat> what is it? I just want to clarify a few things. Um, we actually had out of our 210 objections, about 35 speakers, uh, 35 submitters wanted to speak. And basically, you know, that was not feasible from a council's perspective. So eventually we agreed with the council and Judy that, you know, we will have the group speak, which is the volunteers for the whole of the 150 submitters, 56 submitters we represent and the rest of golf friends. And then some of five individual speakers, which will speak as well. Um, since this process started, um, you know, we weren't sure we will get to the stage. We were not aware that we will get to a stage where we will have a hearing and all that. So we have always decided that we're going to concentrate on the Reserves Act. And we have been in communication with DOC, Department of Conservation, just to see what is the best way, because we always think that that is our backstop. And based on that, one of the reasons that we made sure we didn't join other reserves and all that is because DOC's advice was that if you want to focus on the Reserves Act, it is very critical that that act is very narrow and very focused. And it is basically at the end of the day, it the submissions have to be from people who are directly affected by the revocation of the reserve. It is It just focuses on their well-being and basically on the recreation aspects. And that is the reason that we have not gone out and you know, sit, set out our countdown and collected 4,000 signatures or anything like that. Because from Doc's perspective, you can give them 10,000 signatures, they have no validation if those people from a Reserves Act perspective, if they're not affected by the reserve. So I just wanted to clarify that, that all our submissions, all our petitions have been from within governments. Um, <coughs> Um, the other thing is, that is the, also the reason we have not amalgamated with other reserves and done a dual thing, because as per DOC, you will just muddy the waters. You, myself, I cannot represent what aspects of the other reserves are affecting the well-being and the recreational aspects of the other reserve residents. So we have to stay out of that. So we have followed that process as well. Uh, we have supplied Judy, Julie, sorry, with this document, which is basically our uh, document for the hearing panel, plus some letters from the minister, which are initial consultation, uh, also to Mr. Goff, the mayor, uh, also our local listed MP, uh, list MP, Nicey Chen, and a few other letters. Um, before all this started, we had submitted a document, which we actually supplied, and that was the, basically our petition. And that should have been supplied to you guys because that was done probably three, four months back. If it's not, we can always send this. Yes. I, I can confirm that we've received all of that material and we have read it all. That is great. Thank you. And last thing I want to note is we are have no issues about council selling other properties. We understand that there are situations right now. It's you know difficult times, but we feel that our reserve is a red line for us. It's a valuable asset for us, and we'll, we'll harp on that a little bit. The council is selling over 80 properties, if I'm correct, as per Pakaranga Times. And out of them, I think 21 are reserves. I mean, I can't speak for the, or we can't speak for the other reserves, but from my perspective, you know, yes, we, we are not making or raising any objection. We understand intensification is needed, but it's very critical that, you know, uh, reserves, we are going in a different territory. But anyway, that's that I wanted to just clarify before we start. So after I finish this presentation, I'll have a couple of statements on my own, and then Neil and John and Roger, uh, Angela, Roger's not here, will make their statements as well. I'll right. go to the next page. Let me see if I can do it. So this, this is more of an overall view to put things in perspective. It actually um, was suggested by Mr. Cashmore when he visited us sometime probably a year back. And he said, look, if you want to make a good case, you've got to basically show what you're gaining and what you're losing. <laughs> so this was all this data is from the Auckland Council GeoMaps site. 
And this is give you an idea about the perspective of where the reserve stands. So the Trans Power substation is about 4.7 hectares, which is 47,000 square meters, which is your, on the bottom left of your screen, which is this one. The Elam School, which was built 10 years ago, probably nine years back, and Neil will harp on that a little bit later on. That was a playing field we used to use, which was also you know, taken away from us. And that was a flat field. So now we only got the golf land park. We've got other reserves around golf land, but that's the only flat area we've got. So and that is about 4.46 hectares. So that's 4,600 square meters, roughly. So that just gives you the idea of what we have around in terms of not intensification, but there are houses around the reserve. And then, you know, we've got the substation and the school. Um, as I said, our main focus is the Reserves Act. So I'm going to focus on that. And then Neil's going to talk a little bit on the other aspects from a council perspective. So uh, number one point, and I think many people have harped on this before, but let's let's just go through it again. You know, residents continue to need their green space for leisure, relaxation, mental well-being, physical welfare, harmony, connection to natural environment and activities. Now, all these photographs are from our, from our reserve. If you see the bottom right screen, you will see that the purpose, the title states that the purpose of this land is a recreational reserve. And that's exactly what a point two states. That, you know, the title as recreational reserve, recreational reserve is fundamentally compensated during subdivision when a percentage of land is set aside for this purpose. Revocation goes very much against the aspects of this green space allocation under section 17 of the Reserves Act. Now, we have read the act very well. We have understood everything. We have seek doc advice, and I think we are in a good place. But we have to also convince the council. So we rather do that than, you know, take it to the next level. So number three point is, um, as a process of check and balances, of course, you've got section 24 when you go for the revocation. But it provides the citizens of NZ a layer of oversight under the authority of the conservation minister over such revocation. So um, some of the pictures you see up there was based on last March meeting we had. Some of the pictures shows you uh, recreational activities. The reserve is used. Um, some of the other participants will explain that we don't have a bench or a park in, um, sorry, some playground in there. But that is because we've asked the council or local board and, you know, funds are short. But I think they've come around now and said they, they, if this reserve is there for us, they'll put some things in for us. They understand that the community, due to other int intensification, they need some, you know, better facilities around the park. But we'll get to that point once the whole process ends. This is another very big red flag from a... Uh, reserves X perspective. These all of these photographs are from, sorry, uh, all these photographs are from our reserve. So <coughs> people tend to forget that even if it's a green field, it is a natural habitat for a lot of uh, native species, including our birds. And you know, typically there might be other species, but we see the tuis, the spurwing plover, the fantail, the pukiko around our reserve. And all these pictures have been taken there. I think the thing to note is if you look at the two bottom pictures, the Pakaranga substation, although it's covered by trees, has actually had a big impact on these, you know, species. And you can see in each side of our reserve, you can see the substation in the background. And, you know, this further natural <coughs> and environmental and habitat reduction needs to stop. You know, surplus to requirement argument needs to consider this aspect as well. And, and it's very critical to understand that. This is a reasonable, reasonable red flag as far as the Reserves Act goes. Um, as far as the use of the reserve, it's used quite often. But on every Saturday, we have uh, community yoga, which is not just for golf lens, but also people from Flatbush join us and other areas join us. Um, it is free of cost, and our instructor carries it through every Saturday. Um, it's a good thing and, and community enjoys it. This is more on the Reserves Act again, and I'm not going to harp on it. You guys know exactly what it stands for. I've just highlighted some of the stuff. But the important thing is to say is that the community in Golflands is very united. So last year, we had a um, 
uh, get together with Mr. Luxon. And apparently, of course, we had our list MP, Naisi Chen as well, the councillors who represent us were there. And of course, everyone's against the revocation. Now, we are not aligned to any political party or anything. But at the end of the day, Mr. Luxon is our elected MP. And he knows very well that he needs to step in. And at this stage, he has said that, you know, it is at a local level. Let's just see what happens. Let the council do their job. And then we move on from there. And I agree with him. And basically, eventually, whether he likes it or not, he'll be under pressure to step up. And it'll, you know, we, we nobody wants to go in that direction anyway. And I think I've done my bit now. Um, I want Neil to come in and just talk a little bit on the justifications outside the reserves, actually. So, you know, just, just hang on, Neil. I'll, uh, yep. Morning, everyone. Morning. Uh, uh, Mr. Pinkerton, is it? That's correct, Neil Pinkerton. Thank I just you. like to talk about some uh, other justifications that we've got outside the uh, Reserve Act. And uh, really, we talk about we have significant traffic and parking challenges. Uh, Golfland's Drive is a U shaped drive entering and exiting onto Botany Road, which is a very busy road. One end of uh, Golfland's Drive is controlled with traffic lights. The other is a, well, not quite a free for all, but it's a giveaway sign. At key times in the day, um, the residents have to use Golfland's Drive to go off to work. And uh, school times times coincide with that. So from quarter past eight, roughly, till quarter past nine, there's a good, the, the school gate is right smack in the middle of Golfland's Drive. And you can see from the photographs here what the traffic's like. You also have the the residents trying to get through all that to get to work. Then at the other end of the day, from about, uh, well, they start parking from about two o'clock, but it's from three o'clock to probably four, uh, the traffic really builds up again. And it can take half an hour to get from where the reserve is to the traffic lights at Golfland's Road and then wait through there. The traffic queues right back from the school right to Botany Road. It's 850, it's an integrated school with 850 students and about 50 to 60 staff members. As it's an integrated school, there's no boundaries from where the, from where the pupils can come from. So there's about 30 who actually live in Golflands. The balance come from, without, from outside of Golflands, from uh, places like Beachlands, Ellerslie, and therefore um, most of the pupils come in by car. The school does run two buses, which are partially used, and they run from their other site on Botany Road into, uh, into Golfland's Drive, but uh, that relieves the traffic a little bit, but not too much. Um, so it gives you a bit of an idea of uh, the photographs illustrate what we are up against at two key times during the day. I will change the slide. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, the, the slide tells you everything. Area residents struggle with traffic and parking challenges as the whole of Golflands has only two entry exit points, both of which leads off Golflands Drive. We've got 900 houses, a population of 2,400 people, many of whom are trying to get to work at these key times. And we've covered the part about the school and the number of students and the, the vehicles. Page down. Page down. Yeah. Um, unrelated to the council, uh, the piece of land at 94 Golfland Drive was uh, used as a recreational area for many years. Um, it had been adopted by the council and we had two sets of goalposts on that piece of land plus in this, that was during the winter, and that was used by local residents and sporting clubs at weekends. Uh, in summertime, the grass was mown and we had running tracks and two cricket pitches. So we lost that when the school was built. That's 2.1 hectares of recreational land, which stood there for many years and was well used. And just recently, I think around about December, we lost another 
uh, 400 um, to a reserve at, um, at the end of Simon Owen Place. So all up, we've lost 2.5 hectares of uh, recreational land within Gotham's already. So what we're left with now is the, the last kind of flat bit of green space that can be used uh, for recreation and so forth. The school land, uh, this, the land where the school was built was also a, a natural floodplain. So not only was it used by residents and sports clubs, but um, the wildlife, uh, birds, etc., used that as well. So that uh, natural floodplain is now gone as well. Um, at the time the school was being built, we had uh, discussions with the school and they gave us some undertakings that the uh, piece of the, 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 the uh, local children would be allowed to use the playing fields behind the school. Unfortunately, they've reneged on that. Um, and as you can see, we have a, a sign up saying security. They also have cameras. And if any kids do go into play in there, they're, they are removed by the security people. So, um, going back to the, the key points, Golflands Park is part of, uh, of Golflands Heritage and subdivision and cherished for its green space as it's only park in the area with flat open surfaces for recreational activities. We've talked about the school and giving us an undertaking allowing the, uh, the local children to use it, which unfortunately they've reneged on. Uh, a rationale sometimes put forward for selecting this reserve for re revocation is that it has no playground, which is incidental due to council budget constraints. So you know, we, we're not responsible for putting parks, uh, for, for putting plays and things on those areas. That's a, a local um, government uh, issue. Golf community would love to have a few benches with a small playground on the reserve. And recent discussions with, we've started discussions with the local high board and they would be supportive of it. So I think that really covers uh, my area. Uh, unless you have any questions on that, I'd be happy to answer those. No, I will uh, we'll question at the end. Thank you, Mr. Pinkerton. Okay, lovely. I'll pass on to my next colleague then. Thanks. So that just brings us to our last slide. And, uh, you know, and then I'll make a couple of personal points. So we are only again, once again, representing Golflands and our petition and signatures are all well within Golflands. Uh, once again, we are not intervening on behalf of other reserves and Harvick, and although we have been under a lot of pressure to do that, but it will just make it more political. Uh, you know, we've been sometimes been under pressure. Why not going to the mainstream media? Why is it just in the local press? And we've said, look, we want to keep it local because this is at this stage a local issue. Uh, and we can only represent truly our own reserve. Um, you know, it's it's a different aspect when you're looking, talking about intensification and all that. And there are, you know, people who can come in and talk about stuff like, you know, overall talk about all the reserves are out. And we know that we cannot say everything. Um, so, we, you know, we sincerely request the Auckland Council and appointed officials to intervene at this early stage and keep the goodwill of our residents. Because we are very confident that it's going to be sort of, it, it, it'll be a very high wall to climb when it comes to passing the Reserves Act. And I've put some footnotes there. We strongly believe in the preservation of our reserve, merits of our arguments, in a democratic process of checks and balances. That's where the hearing panel and all this process comes in. Once again, our elected MP is committed to his constituents to debate this in parliament if necessary. Nobody wants to go there. Right? Because when these things happen, we all know it, the waters get muddied and the actual message gets lost. Um, but, you know, emotions run high around golf fans for this particular reserve. And, yeah, you know, he, our elected officials will be under pressure. Um, and if this process eventually goes to DOC, on whose recommendation the conservation minister will make the decision, we, the residents of Golf Lens as citizens, are confident that our case is justified, as we have taken DOC advice throughout the whole process. And as I said, we have focused on the Reserves Act. So um, 
that's basically I, what I'm presenting from the community perspective. I've just got a couple of points from my own personal point of view. So I'll just get out of there. And I just want to say that I want to request the council to consider all aspects of this. And I, when I say council, I mean Panicu and everybody. I mean, I'm going to just go a little bit outside the square or let's say um, out of line a little bit and say, think about the three waters reform. You know, that's where the central government's coming in and asking the local government, you know, that we want certain of your valued assets. And really, is the council going to give up their assets without standing up to it? No, they're not. In the same way, this reserve is a valuable asset for us. And we are going to not, not give it up easily. The other thing is intensification, we totally agree, is necessary. If someone next door to me sells his private land and a, you know, a developer builds it, that's the rules of the you know, local community, local council. We've got to just work with it. We can't do much. But I think the reserves is a bit of a red line. And, and that's what we are focusing on. And let me put it this way. Um, you know, when we start en endeavoring into such things like selling our reserves, we are getting into a race to the bottom. And in the end, nobody wins that race, to be honest. Let's not get there. That's all I have from my two bits. Thank you. If there's any questions, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Desai. Um, just uh, <clears throat> my understanding from the uh, from the uh, council report to us, or the reporting officer's report to us, um, and I'm just reading from um, and just to cite it, it's page 45 of the uh, of the, the, the report to us. <clears throat> this this reserve was taken uh, was vested um, from subdivision in 1995. What was what subdivision was that? That was presumably because there was a, a, a subsequently a, um, a small area acquired from Transpower the following year. This presumably wasn't a subdivision that was in any way related to Transpower's development of the substation. It was uh, something else. Do you, do you do you have knowledge of that? Yeah, would you have knowledge of that? Yeah. Yes, you can. Sorry. Queen Eagles, the subdivision. Come and have a chat quickly. Uh, so Terry's was the one who's. Has he's lived here over thirty years, so he can say a few things. But then I'll come back. Thank you. Hi, Terry Brunton, um, resident since nineteen ninety five. Um, that subdivision was Glen Eagles, which was uh, you know part of the Greater Golfins uh, subdivision, but the subdivision was Glen Eagles. Right. Okay. Thank you. And then, and the the, the Transpower. So when was the Transpower site actually developed as as the current substation? Well, it was always there, but it, um, it, it, it was it was extended and, and moved. Uh, gee, ten years ago. Yeah, ten years. Yeah. Around about ten years ago. Because they had a big okay. So, so uh, prior to that, did uh, did residents have access to open space on the other side of the creek there or not? No, but it was used by uh, the local pony club. Uh, used used the land, but but that but that was all. Yeah. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> All right, thank you for that. Appreciate that. Um, that's all yeah, I'm fine. That's fine, thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> All right, well, we certainly, uh, I mean, we understand where you're coming from, Mr. Desai, and, and, uh, um, and your particular group. So, um, should, should we move through to individual submissions now? Sure. And, and thank you for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, so I'll probably, uh, Julia, I'll log off, right? Not log off, but get my video off. And then, you know, next one I think is Nellen. And then when it's time for Terry, we'll switch back on. Yeah, thank video. you. Thank you. All right. That's the end of the group. Yeah, that's the end of the group. Right, okay. So where do we go now? Do we go to... To Nellen. So is uh, Nellen, and I'm, apologies for, is it... Uh, <clears throat> right, I... I'm hesitant to even hazard a guess at how to pronounce your surname. Can you look, advise us what your surname is? Uh, sorry. Yeah. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, it's a bit. Uh, My name bit. is Invitilica. Right. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, you, do, you, do you have a video that you can turn on? Okay, just a minute, I will share the slides. Can you see the slide? Uh, no, sure, we want to share your screen. We really just wanted to see you, that was all. If you've got uh, your video on. Yeah. Yes. That's right. right. Ah, yeah. Right. Share right. Slides. right. Perfect. Excellent. We can see you now. Just a minute. Yeah. Yeah. I want to see, uh, get the slides. Okay, can you see the slides? They're just coming up. Right? Just wait one second, they're still coming up at the moment. Oh, I see. There All we right. go. There we go. Please right. Right. Yeah, okay. we'll that. Thank you very much uh, and uh, good morning to the hearing panel as well as the other officials and uh, thanks a lot for inviting us uh, to do this uh, presentation see mine uh, let me introduce my name is nalin vijayathilaka and uh, uh, my daytime job is i am a advisor consultant to uh, uh, new zealand businesses to be resilient against disruptions and disasters and catastrophes so that's my end I am also, uh, I enjoy, you know, uh, doing um, yoga for the last so many years and I'm the uh, voluntary yoga instructor here in the community. Right. I have, I don't take, uh, will not take much time and um, just, just a brief um, agenda what I'm going to talk about, the brief overview of uh, uh, the 111 Golf and Drive, what we are doing and community and cultural and that is what we are concerned about and economic benefit of the park like this and uh, what we are focusing, I am focusing with uh, my um, followers and uh, team people is the recreation and well-being uh, and the productive use of the usage of the uh, park. And also, I want to refer to the UN resolution on, you know, green spaces and parks. You know, this is uh, what, you know, the whole world is concerned about. And of course, you know, even after my presentation. So brief overview, actually some of these things have been explained by this. Right? So this is, uh, have been developed uh, as uh, being locked, blocked uh, when it was planned. That's what I heard. I have been here in Golfland for the last uh, seven plus years. And I have seen it's a very closely knit community. And uh, the people, it's I, I would call it a village. You know, it's people know each other and they relate to each other and they are very, very friendly and accommodating. So, Golfland has, uh, of course, this is um, from the internet statistics, uh, 2,400 uh, 60 people, 48.2% uh, are male and 51.8% are female, so equally balanced. And uh, so most of the, I would say it's uh, fairly, in fact, my children also say that um, there, is, there are a lot of, you know, retirees here, I don't know. So the 16% of the people are below 15 years. This is, I, I think, I, I don't know the st latest statistics. So Bollfront is, as I mentioned, it's a uh, people, care about each other. That's the most important thing. And it's, uh, they have a very harmonious and friendly lifestyle and uh, uh, is unique to uh, this place. So this is a very important slide. Why our community is this Golfland, uh, the this, uh, help to gel together a real community, community feeling. So a uh, role in maintaining healthy ecosystem. Actually today, you know, health and well-being is one of the primary things. People may have money, people will have wealth, but if they don't have the health and well-being, uh, 
everything is lost. And that's why, we, especially with this pandemics and COVID-19 coming into play, they have, everybody has realized. And green spaces are becoming more and more important today. And combating greenhouse gases is, uh, if you look at, you know, the CO2 emissions, I have got the green uh, efforts by United Nations and all that. Still, it is continually rising. And say, so if we uh, lose these um, green spaces, it is irreversible. That is the most thing. You cannot put it to right. So it is very important that we keep this uh, green space and make the best use of it for recreation and well-being. And it has been happening. And it is. This is actually. It's a major concern not only for people in golf but across the, the world. So parks contribute here to golf biodiversity and ecology. Actually, as uh, this I and the other members mentioned, because this traffic during was, you know that, you know, slow moving vehicles emit high percentage of carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide. So this is it leads into air pollution. And unless you have these pockets of green spaces, that will be consumed by the uh, people around. And that will cause uh, and uh, affect, you know, people's, uh, especially as I mentioned earlier, most of the people are fairly, you know, aging uh, population here and it very vulnerable. So this is a thing that really needs to be uh, uh, taken care. And actually, as I said, you know, the, it's it's a it's a community. Communities are living uh, systems. So they 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 need to they need to be nourished to consciousness. That is uh, very important. And of course, they need to as any human being, they need to breathe. So if you don't have these are uh, green spaces. It will uh, really, it's a slow death, slow killing. So I don't think, you know, nobody wants that to happen. We want a healthy and especially the younger generation. Actually, we uh, we will not live another 25 years. I don't know. So for the younger kids and youth, we had to create that space for them to live freely and healthily. So this is something which will contribute for their future. And of course, as I mentioned, it is um, having the screen spaces, it, yes, um, it will improve the air quality. It will maintain, these are all part of the ecosystem, maintain the natural habitats. You know, if you go in the morning, you can see the amount of birds and, you know, small creatures sex around that place uh, it's it's really amazing so and this is as constantly we have been uh, mentioning that it is the flat ground I, I don't think we have any of these green spaces in the girlfriend Gulf, community so flat as this ideal for sports or playing um, uh, games or yoga and things like that that's what uh, we are making use of it so actually it is a uh, uh, a health hub, I would say. It is the we call it the lungs of golf land. That's why I said that breathing fresh air is the lungs of the the community. And it also yoga. The yoga instructor has been um, doing yoga uh, in this place for the last uh, two years or so. But winter time we find very difficult to do it. But other than that, we continue and it has become very very popular it's free of charge no charge and um, it is um, now these days we are starting at 7 30 but when the uh, sun rises uh, shifted to 8 30. happy family it is a community and we actually i am also part of the uh, uh, Motney and Flash, Flatbush ethnic uh, community, actually. So this is one of the um, uh, pictures taken recently. So this uh, to, togetherness is very important for a community. The, if when you don't have these things, only the 
people mentally and emotionally as well as you know physically fall sick and also there can be other things when they when there is for people to develop and have uh, uh, recreation and uh, uh, things like that uh, people will not my mission and i am contributing and this space is so essential it is actually as as said this actually the i can share this slides this is a un publication in their research done on this uh, uh, green spaces and the green spaces have to be created more and more still actually this this the this the government has a unique Um, um, advantage because it is very close to the library, the co uh, other community centers, as well as the the uh, supermarkets and all that, and the bus stops and uh, bus station, as well as it is away from that. So it is the village. So uh, we, uh, I, we have been living in Avondale, and before that I was in. Uh, we were in. Uh, um, uh, uh, somewhere as you know in and then we never um, uh, realized that uh, this type of you know community existed in those places uh, so uh, that is why you know i feel that it's a it's a unique so this is a uh, this uh, reference is available uh, i can share these slides uh, it's a U united nations you know uh, uh, work done on that uh, un and uh, Uh, WHO. So the green spaces are so so essential. So moving forward, so I said uh, uh, what I had to say, but you know, moving for forward, it's very important to create modern the park maintenance. It's not happening. I read regularly. Had to remind them to mow the grass. Uh, otherwise, very uh, people can injure and fall when there's too much of grass. You can't do yoga, and of course, you know, install proper flood lighting. You know, the, uh, in the night, then we can even do things like uh, uh, other games and children, uh, kids could play uh, only till little late in the evening if there is. Most of the uh, parks, you know, around the world, I have seen, you know, there. Very well lit. So basically, that is what I need to. I have taken my time allocation so much again, and I'm sure you you will definitely allow this park to remain with the community. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nolan. Thank, Thank you. you for that, and and <clears throat> we. Uh, Uh, we do have a copy of the slides. No, I don't. If you wouldn't mind emailing those through to me, that would be wonderful. Thank you. I will do that certainly. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for the submission. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> the uh, next on my list is Don Sylvester. If uh, Mr. Sylvester, are you there? Excuse me, uh, Julie. Can I just um, can you hear us? This is the sound. Yes, um, I think Nathan is still here at the moment. I, I just wanted to say, uh, John, we forgot that John Mooney and Angela Schneiderman from our team wanted to have two-minute statements each, which somehow we missed. So I just want you to accommodate that. I've sent you a message. So whenever you have that slot, oh, that's that's fine. I mean, if uh, if, um, if those two people wish to address us now, let's take them now, and uh, we'll we'll come back to uh, Mr. Sylvester. That, that's great. Thank you. Um, In the meantime, could Nayland please stop sharing his screen? Nayland, if you can stop sharing your screen, please. Click on the camera. Yeah. Okay, you go ahead. Right. Thank you. So, uh, Good morning, uh, Angela Schneiderman. Um, I'm actually a resident in Golfins and have been um, in Golfins for the past 26 years. Um, I have actually moved twice within the Golfins area, well, within Golfins. 
um, to make up the 26 years. I've got two. I've raised two children here, and I'm um, one of them still living at home. Um, I have a sister that lives in Golfins as well, and she's been here for 17 years, and so we're a really close knit community and family, obviously. <laughs> Um, I feel very strongly that it's very important to keep our green space for recreational and mental well-being. Even more so now, a lot of people are working from home under circumstances beyond our control. So it's actually nice to get up and have a walk outside and go walk around the reserve and then maybe on certain days have lunch out there and just breathe in that fresh air. The infrastructure around Botany is now basically a concrete jungle, very compact, and our community needs to have green spaces. And that's why we need to obviously keep those green spaces. Um, once they're gone, we can't get them back. So I feel very strongly in keeping that green space. Um, I look... Uh, Golfins is actually what I would call a horseshoe, Golfins Drive. It's true, there's only one, two ways in and out. One's got lights, one hasn't. It, I don't know if you've been out to Botany lately, but Botany Road is so congestive all of the time. Not certain parts of the day, but all of the time. Um, and with the school, Elin, being here, um, the car, I've noticed since working from home, just you just cannot go out basically in the times that peak, children are being dropped off and, you know, picked up. And it's true that you're getting parents that are driving over our driveways, waiting for their kids to come out of school, and that's just not on. Um, and basically the impact on the building, you know, of this land with um, Goldflin's residents, dramatically um, we will be losing the space, the green space, and that to me is not on. <laughs> um, I've always been under the impression that when um, you bought a home by reserve, um, it will never be built on. Um, and justifications under the Act 1977 um, that reserves that public have got the freedom of entry, um, and if that was to be built on, um, you know. Basically, I think that is just not on, especially with Botany now. So much like a concrete jungle, we need to be able to go into those green spaces. And as I say, there's a lot of recreational things that are happening over there now, now that the school's where it is. There was lots of soccer and everything that used to go on there. And I think that, you know, we need something without having to go out of our own area to be able to go to. Um, and I basically don't think the council should sell the reserve um, making revenue just because of their shortfalls um, because, as I say, it's not an asset. It's something that was there for us and to, for us to use. So I'd like to thank you very much for that and take that under consideration. I'll be so upset if this plan does go ahead because, you know, I've lived here a long time and I still want to live here a long time. So we've got the whole backing of the Golfins community here. So I hope you take all of this into consideration. Thank you, Ms. Schneiderman. Um, can you tell me when, when, was, um, uh, when was the school built? About 10 years ago. Um, and 10 years ago, that was a bit of, well, we sort of knew that it was going to be a school there at some stage. But um, Elam was actually on Botany Road um, and still is there. But this is the junior campus of uh, Elam. So um, basically most of the children that do go there are out of zone. And um, I, I think it's, I don't know if you say partly private or whatever, but there's my sister, for example, who lives in Golflands, who backs onto the school. Um, basically she was going to send her daughter there. But because she wasn't a, well, I don't know if it comes down to Christian or, or whatever, she didn't wasn't able to send her daughter to school there. So, um, and, you know. And what, was, the, was the community able to use the, uh, um, the playing fields in the early days of the school or that, uh, you know, the, the security fencing, is that, is that recent or is that uh, longer term? 
Oh, yes, we did used to use it for Christmas parties, yes, and all sorts of things. Yeah. Yeah. Sister in the back. Oh, yeah. This is Sandra. I just I live at the back of the school. I am to my sister. But years ago, they used to, well, we all used to have big Christmas get-togethers and things there, and they used to play soccer, like they have spoken earlier about it, and it was great. Um, and that was probably the biggest piece of land that we had that we were able to do that. And now that's all gone. We now do, don't have the opportunity for our kids to, to go anywhere apart from across the road here. They cycle up there. Well, my daughter does, meets her friends there, and they have a get-together. And with COVID as well, it's even more important that our kids, for their mental health, have that space. And it's really important. So please, we need to keep it. Yeah, just come back to my question, and, and that is when, 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 when did you cease to have the ability to use those playing fields? Or from probably when they started building the school. Yeah. It wasn't that long about, after. About, 20, about 2010. Oh, 2010. We started building yeah. the school. Yeah. He's asking when you stopped using the fields. Yeah. yeah. That's when we actually did stop using the fields. And um, and basically now they were going to originally leave part of the back of the school, of the, of the field, um, for us to be able to use. But that obviously has been reneged. So... Um, it's used for their 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 children um, from school for activities and stuff like that. So um, we haven't got anything else. And you just go out of Goffins Drive and you come into that concrete. And the, the letter about the school is all in that uh, representation that was sent through to on those slides and things. Yeah. Yeah. But it's difficult because the school is there now. It's all closed up. It's gated at the weekend. So we don't have any option. We couldn't get there even if, you know, if the school allowed us. Yeah. You know. We understand. I just wanted to get a date when uh, when that, that, that facility yeah, so was not to you. Oh, that's yeah. fine. Thank you. Basil, do you have any? No, that's quite clear. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Shulman. I appreciate uh, <coughs> stepping in. That's, for, that's good of you. And uh, Mr. Mooney. <coughs> good morning, Chairman, Commissioners, and Julie. I uh, just want to thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to uh, voice our concerns. Um, I was originally one of the people who canvassed the Goldsman's area. Um, can I just stop you there, Mr Mooney, can I just stop you there for a moment? Can you ask your colleagues behind not to talk over because we're getting, uh, we're getting feedback through the microphones. Thank you. Sorry. Um, it's all right. So I was one of the original on, on the committee and originally did the canvassing of the area to get a feel for how the rest of Dolphins felt about the fact that um, the council were wanting to sell our reserve. By far the vast majority of people that I spoke to were on our side if you like, in favour of, of not selling the reserve. Um, even, the, even the new immigrants um, were horrified to think that a council would sell public, uh, public land that, that, that the public used. Only three people that I can think of that didn't um, didn't care either way whether it was sold or whether it wasn't sold. Out of the hundreds I spoke to, that was only three that voiced an opinion that you know, they don't care. Um, so overwhelming support from the people that I spoke to um, not to sell the reserve. Apart from everything that the um, the public will lose if this uh, sale goes ahead, there is one large um, effect that will, that will create. Some of the previous people have touched on this, so I just want to go a little bit further into it. The land will be sold, obviously, to the, the highest bidder. The highest bidder is going to be the person or organisation that can put the most number of dwellings on that um, piece of land and get the return from that. We understand um, it's probably more now. Um, it could be 40 apartments built on that piece of land. Um, it's in the area where they can go six storeys high. Apartments built on that land <coughs> would probably have very few, if no, parking facilities. The uh, only place that, uh, that they're forced to park is on the side of the street. In itself, yep, that's, that's fine. The problem arises with the school. As I say, many people have um, mentioned this so far. The school is only about 150 metres up the road from the uh, from the, from the um, reserve, and as has been alluded to, only two percent 
of the Goldfinns population uh, children go to the school. That means 98% of the children are trucked into the, into the area, transported into the area, should I say. At present, what happens, the parents drive their children to the, to the school, find a place to park on the side of the road, they get out with their children, walk them to the school, see them safely into the school gate, and then come back to their cars and then go away again. That in itself is uh, a huge traffic problem. Adding to that, if you've got 40 apartments on that land, probably two cars per apartment would probably be a safe estimate. It's 80 cars parked on the road, both sides of the road. When the people come to, to drop their kids at school, it's not going to be anywhere or very little places for them to pull over and, and take their kids to the school. What will happen, what I can see is going to happen, that the parents will double park let the kids out of their car and have them find their own way to the footpath and then walk their own way to the school and back. A situation I think is not acceptable. It's, it's, a, it's a safety issue. <clears throat> People are double parking on a road which is already very, very congested. So I, I think um, having, having uh, apartments built on that section uh, is not going to be a good thing. And as has been alluded to, even now it can take 20 minutes, half an hour to get from the reserve to Botany Road. Okay, for me personally, um, three generations of my whanau have used and used the reserve. My son learned to throw and catch a baseball. He later on then went on to the Pakaranga, to play for Pakaranga, um, how Pakaranga Baseball Club. Something that would have never have happened had, had he and I not been able to go out to the reserve there and throw a baseball around. Um, we use the reserve probably on average once a week, our family. Uh, yoga, we have a special frisbee which we use to fly around the place. Um, my grandson uh, practices to ride his mini motocross bike under my supervision on the reserve. Um, if there was a playground or on the park, we would use it even more. Now, every time our grandkids would come over, we would be over there using the, using the reserve. Um, in the past, every Guy Fawkes, people bring their families to the reserve to live with their firecrackers. Uh, it's much safer to do that than have them living them off in their backyards. And with the size of the houses um, being built today, with very little back, uh, backyards and front yards, it would be extremely dangerous to live with firecrackers from there. So that is one of the things that, that it is used for. I've, I've seen people playing soccer, people flying kites, even someone flying a drone, exercising dogs, and there's also people who practice their, their uh, chipping for their golf on the, on the reserve. So the reserve and my neighbour across the road, son, used to use it frequently for practicing his um, rugby uh, football kicking. He used to do drop kicks, place kicks, punts. He'd be over there all the time using it. If that reserve wasn't there, unable to do it. Um, we supposedly live in a democracy with basically the uh, majority rules. 1,200 Goldfinns residents signed our petition against the sale. 220 of them, <coughs> 220 of them took the, the time and effort to write in a written submission. Had the committee not said, we will represent you guys, those numbers would be way higher. Um, not only in the um, written submissions, but also in the verbal submissions. We had way more than what we're getting today because we are representing them. Um, our Labour List MP, Nasi Chen, she is against the sale of the reserve. The Leader of the Opposition, our, our local MP, Christopher Luxon, is against the sale of our, and also is uh, National Simeon Brown, against the sale of our reserve. The two Howard Board Representatives on the Howard Council, Sharon, Sharon Stewart and Paul Young, both voted against the sale of our reserve. This is overwhelming support and a large majority of the residents against the sale of our reserve. Phil Goff recently said his job was to govern with the consent of the public and that it would be arrogant of him not to. Well, Mr Goff and Auckland Council, you do not have the consent of the Goldfinns residents to sell our park reserve. When asked why our reserve was um, 
selected to be sold, the only reason, <coughs> excuse me, the only reason we were given was the fact that we didn't have a playground on the on the park on the reserve. Well, I'm sorry, it's not the residents' fault that there's no playground on there. That's the, that's the job of the council. So why should we then get can, be penalised, have our reserve taken away because they didn't put a park on our uh, a playground on our reserve? As you uh, all well know by now, um, the land was um, had, was required to be gifted to the council. As they said, it was for the fitness, health and mental well-being of the people in the area, their words. So what's changed? Is the fitness, health and mental well-being of, of the people suddenly not important? I'll tell you actually what has changed, the population growth in, in the Goblins in the surrounding area. Where there was one house, with one family on one section, now they're being replaced by three, two to three storey houses with three or more families, with no backyards or front yards for recreation. So now how important is our reserve? The more infill housing, the greater the need for the open spaces, green spaces. With the population growth in the area, I feel it would be irresponsible for council to remove this public access. As so many people have said, once the open green spaces are gone, it's gone forever. Now is the time for this green space to be protected for all future generations. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Moody. Um, thank you for that. Um, just one very small comment that I think I should probably make. Um, uh, in, in terms of what might happen if this reserve uh, was revoked, we have nothing before us in terms of what might happen next. So we we, we really can't take into consideration the, in, the risk case scenario. assumptions about what might happen next. So just make that point, that's all. That's great. Right. Okay. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. So thank you for that group. Uh, thank you, Mr. Desai, for uh, bringing that to our attention. We appreciate that. Thank uh, you. <clears throat> right. So now I'm back to, or not back to, but uh, Mr. Sylvester, if, if you're there. Yes, I am. You, can you hear me? You can indeed, and thank you for uh, pausing there. Appreciate that. No, that's great. Um, so uh, this is this is on behalf of me, me and my wife. We've lived in Golfland for the last 15 years, and uh, my wife's a nurse. I'm retired, but uh, we and we live up um, Pebble Beach Place, which is just down the road from the reserve. In the 1980s, the Bass family sold their land for development of Golflands. The suburb of Golflands was planned and developed with a clear vision and strategy. This resulted in a community with quiet residential streets and reserves and green spaces. The Golflands community appreciated the investment in improving walking and cycling tracks, planting trees which encourage bird life, building the bridges in areas where the natural environment is, is enhanced, for example, the tidal streams and marshes. For many Golflands residents, the quiet streets and the reserve, reserves is the key reason we chose Golflands as a place to call home. The public notice of 24th February said that the reserves are surplus to council's requirements and not required for council's current or future service. On its website, the Auckland City Council acknowledges the importance of green spaces and reserves. It states, an increasing body of evidence suggests that a close, that a closer connection to nature is good for our heads, hearts and lungs. So the council on one hand is saying how precious and important our green spaces and reserves are for physical and mental well-being. Yet on the other hand, the council seeks to actively destroy green spaces by a revocation of reserves such as 111 Golfland Tribe. This is clear hypocrisy of council actions regarding loss of our precious green spaces. As Auckland grows, our precious green spaces are under threat. There is, yes, um, the Reserves Act states that open spaces must be retained for the purposes of providing areas of recreation and sporting activities and physical welfare of the public for protection of natural environment and the beauty of the countryside. Reserves shall be conserved as they contrib contribute to the pleasantness, harmony and cohesion of the natural environment. Health and well-being. A New Zealand Centre for Sustainable Cities paper in 2017 clearly established a blueprint for de de developing sustainable communities, including the need to maintain and develop green spaces and reserves. 
It stated urban reserves, urban residents should live within 300 metres of green spaces. The removal of the reserve in Golfland Drive will result in some members of, of Golfland Drive and Bob Charles Drive living further than 300 metres from a green space. This hearing has been delayed three times due to COVID lockdown since mid-August. The mental health of young people has been significantly impacted by lockdowns and council should take note of this when considering the importance of green spaces. A new Danish study has found that when children grow up with green spaces around, they have 55% less risk of developing a range of mental health and problems later in life. Researchers found exposure to greenery reserves and parks for children up to the age of 10 lowers the risk of 16 mental health disorders. The findings of the study affirmed integrating sustainable natural environments into urban planning is a concept to be included in urban planning for well-being of residents and reduction of the global burden of psychiatric disorders. Other studies conclude that res residents are less likely to suffer ill effects from ob obesity if they live close to a park. So in, cl in conclusion, 111 Golfland Strive is not surplus to the requirements of the Golfland's community and ratepayers. The approach is in total disagreement with the statements of the 1977 Reserves Act, which states that green spaces must be maintained. No case has been made by Auckland City Council why reserve, recreational reserves are either surplus to requirements or why they no longer meet the amenity of a recreational reserve. The reserve serves to enhance the health and well-being of the community. The reserve is used appropriately and regularly by the Golfland's community for the purpose of recreation. Once green spaces are gone, they are gone forever. Our objection today to the revocation of the reserve at 111 Golfland's Drive is spoken on behalf of future generations. Thank you very much. Um, any <coughs> any comments or questions? No, thank you very much. Very clear. Thank you. Uh, all right. Thank you. Uh, thank you both for uh, for the submission, and uh, <clears throat> we'll certainly take that on board. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Cheers. All right. Thank you. Um, now we have uh, Elijah Shah. Is uh, yep. I'm there? here. I'm here. Right. Thank you. A very good morning to everyone in this panel, Julie, and all who are watching online. I will be very short and crisp. I won't take long because all the previous presenters have already um, presented uh, what I have to say. So I'm just going to be very short. Um, as all the presenters have already prepared slides and presentations, I do not have any slides or any presentation, nor do I have any statistics or any, you know, legal stuff. But I'm going to speak from my heart. As Angela said, um, this reserve is so, so close to our heart. So let me introduce myself first. My name is Shaila Jasha, but uh, my preferred name is Shaila. And I am a resident of this beautiful Golfland um, for the last uh, nine years. So 2013, we moved to Golflands. Now, we migrated from India to New Zealand 20 plus years. And we had an option to go to Australia, go to Canada or New Zealand. And we chose New Zealand because it's green, it's clean and it's beautiful. And not a concrete jungle. The council have provided these green spaces for us uh, in and around Golfland. It is very, very sensible thing because we can go for walks. We can take our dogs for a walk. It's relaxing and we use these places as recreation. And especially during pandemic and a lockdown, this was the only place where we could go for a walk and we could meet and greet our neighbors because we could not see them. You know, we were all locked down. We were working from home. So this was the only place we could do. And we and, and I can tell you, Golfland is such a wonderful neighborhood. We have our street barbecues. We support each other. We look after each other. 
even when I go out of town, you know, my street, they look after my house. So it's a wonderful neighborhood. And the thought of a reserve getting sold to a builder and who will then turn that green space into a high rise building or a concrete jungle. It shudders me as we left that concrete jungle and came here to breathe the fresh air. With high rise building, um, it will be a chaotic, congested, polluted. And I think all my other previous speakers have already explained how chaotic and how, as it is already due to school, you know, we already have a lot of traffic coming in and going out. So it's going to be more chaotic because there'll be apartments, there'll be people coming in, the car parking, name it. Um, the green space, and this is the exact reason we left our birth country. The green space is enjoyed by everyone, all the rate payers. And I think we are proud to be part of this neighborhood. And if this space is not sold, we will be happy campers. So my question is, why this reserve? And why are we punished for nothing? Um, I humbly request um, to reserve, to preserve our reserve because we deserve. Thank you very much uh, from my bottom of my heart. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak. And thank you, Julie, for your continuous um, communication regarding this forum. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Michelle. I appreciate the uh, submission. Um, thank, thank you. Very clear. Yeah. Understand the passion. Absolutely. Right, sure. All right. Thank you. Um, we're now going to hear from uh, George and Susan uh, Lamprecht, if uh, they're there. Are you there? Hi. It's Neil Pinkerton here. I'm uh, reading uh, George and Susan's um, submission because Susan has just returned from hospital and can't really be here herself this morning. So it's George and Susan Lamprecht, 106 Golflands Drive, Golflands. We have lived on Golflands Drive for 23 years near the reserve. We chose the house not only for its proximity to Botany Shopping Centre, but because of the reserves <clears throat> and walkways we have come to enjoy so much. Our young grandchildren loved kicking a football around their ground, as they called it. As are our neighbours enjoyed having picnics there too. We see young families and other grandparents taking advantage of the open space even now. We would love to see some trees like Kofi planted there to encourage our tuis, fantails and wax eyes return. George and me also have a major concern in regard to parking. If units are built there, as today it appears, that only one park is available per unit. We have the Elam Campus Junior and Intermediate School just a few houses down the road. It is bad enough with parents driving their children to school in the mornings and most schools days, the cars start arriving at 1.45 p.m. in the afternoon, parked on both sides of the road. With the traffic lights at this end, cars are back, backed up almost to the school crossing after 3 p.m. We both fear an accident is waiting to happen. Yours sincerely, Susan Lamprecht and George Lamprecht. Thanks. Thank you. I appreciate you uh, reading that for us. Now, we don't actually have a copy of that, I don't think, so no. could, uh, could you uh, get that through to us? Yep, we can organise that, no problem. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and then finally, Terry Brunton, I think, is, uh, is our final submitter. Yeah, good, good morning all. Uh, my name's Terry Brunson. Um, my wife Marlene and I live at Nine Bar Place, uh, which is on the southwestern boundary of the 111 Golflands Reserve. Um, we've lived there since 1995. Um, we, we bought the section from the developer off the plans and uh, the year before, and were one of the first homes built on the then Glen Eagle subdivision. We chose the section because it backed onto the reserve and to the westland 
owned by Transpower, which was a buffer zone for the power station. Our section is by design not fenced on either of these boundaries. Over the last 26 years, we have enjoyed watching local children at play, dogs being exercised and native bird life on the reserve. I have myself on many occasions used the reserve whilst trying to sharpen up my short golf game, albeit unsuccessfully. <laughs> up there right away, um, James and Kathy, Larry and Barbara, Simon and Donna and Ian and Julie are all long-time residents of Golflands, um, each in excess of 20 years. They have over this time used the reserve with their children and grandchildren whilst they've been growing up. The developer of Golflands had pockets of reserve land planned all through the stages of the subdivision development, which made the purchase of these sections desirable. As property owners, we can all claim to be co-owners of these reserves through association. Now, not unsubstantial rates pay for their upkeep and maintenance. Whilst I appreciate the need for high-density housing in Auckland, close to transport links, and would accept, albeit reluctantly, that if a neighbour was to sell and the new owner chose to build this style of housing on site, it is completely unacceptable to me that Council would consider selling off some of our reserves for the same purpose. We've all spoken about uh, the major issue of traffic flow um, in regards to the Elam School. Um, further congestion with uh, potential housing would obviously further exacerbate this problem. I ask that you do not change the status of this and other reserves in the area and that they continue to be used for the purpose that they were designed for so many years ago. Thank you. Can I ask you, you, you mentioned that when the subdivision went through um, that there was intended to be a, 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 a well, I'm not quite sure how, how extensive the green space areas were supposed to be, little pocket parks or whatever they happened to be. Did that eventuate? I mean, when, when we can, when we come out and have a look, it would be helpful to to see some of those. If they if they did eventuate, or have they been resumed, or those those uh, little parks and reserves are all through Golflands, um, and yeah. This is the only flat. One. This is the this is the only flat one. The uh, the other ones are uh, tend to be around the estuaries, and uh, but uh, right. yeah, there's, there's a lot of them. Well, we'll obviously have a look at that on Monday when we come through. So that's good. Any questions? Just a question. Remind me, what was the number of your um, of your address? Nine Bad Place. Nine. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Mr. Brunton. Thanks for the submission. <clears throat> um, right. Well, that's the as far as I'm. Well, yes, that's the uh, that's the end of submissions on uh, on Golfland. So we'll just have a conversation with uh, uh, with the reporting staff, if you wouldn't mind, uh, Mr. May and company, just uh, coming up on the screens. Right. Um, in terms of a. Uh, re response. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the, your intentions are. Can you just uh, give us a, an insight into what you plan on doing now? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I propose to make some uh, general observations and then um, just answer some of the points that were raised um, regarding the individual properties. Um, and then I will hand over to um, Ezra Barwell, who will uh, talk about um, the, act, the, the assessment criteria um, for, for the reserves. Um, I will also make um, some observations um, regarding the rationalisation and consultation around the properties. Uh, my colleague, Anthony, is on leave today, um, but he did jot down some notes for me. Um, so I can I can make those points, although I am not best qualified to answer any questions that might um, that you might have regarding them. 
Okay. Right. And uh, um, are you in, uh, are you prepared to go now, or do you want a, a short break to uh, to confer? Um, if it's all right, I wouldn't mind a, a five minute recess, uh, principally so I can have a comfort break. Yeah. All right. All right. Let's uh, <clears throat> let's uh, be generous, and we'll resume at half past eleven. Thank you. Okay. Lovely. Thank you very much.
All right, we're back. Uh, thank you, Mr. May. Oh, he's still muted. There he is. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, right. Okay. Now, I might just, just, just before you start, I might uh, ask you also to follow up with a, a written version of what you're, you're uh, uh, about to, to tell us, so that we've got a written record of that, if you wouldn't mind. Um, to put in a timeline for that at the end of your, your uh, uh, maybe you can give us an indication as to what might be reasonable in terms of a timeline on that. Thank you. Um, uh, if, if, if you uh, if, if you want to have my uh, my notes verbatim, um, I can send them to you immediately. I finished. Okay, brilliant. That's fine. Thank you. Okay, great. Right. Okay. Well, I, I'd like to start by acknowledging. Um, all the submitters over the last couple of days. I, I do appreciate that um, you know, they have you know, very strong and sincerely held um, opinions over, over their reserves. Um, so I would like to um, just assure them that you know, council officers don't live in some central hive emerging only from time to time to plague uh, the honest ratepayers uh, of Auckland. Um, we do actually live in our communities as well, and we fully appreciate uh, the importance of open space. Uh, we do not undertake or propose um, reserve revocations um, frivolously or on a whim. Um, I would just note there are three ways a city can grow. It can grow in via intensification, it can grow up via high-rise buildings, or it can grow out via urban sprawl. Uh, I think most people would agree that uh, from an environmental perspective, urban sprawl is best avoided if possible. Um, we acknowledge intensification naturally will bring its problems um, in terms of increased traffic, uh, strain on infrastructure and the like. Um, the council is attempting to uh, address these um, you know, th with, with Auckland Transport and with Healthy Waters and uh, through in, um, I, infrastructure improvements. Um, just worth bearing in mind, I think um, one of the first submitters uh, mentioned that he had lived in London. Um, well, worth bearing in mind that the urban area, that is the built area of Auckland, is more than one third the size of the built area of London, uh, but is supporting one sixth of the population. Um, we acknowledge that open space is precious and the provision of open space is one of the key functions of the council. Uh, Auckland Council every year spends more than it, acquire, more than it receives in, in, in open space sales to acquire new open space. Um, but open space, while several submitters have said it is not an asset, um, it is an asset in terms of the, uh, the function that it has for the local community. It is an asset that does require management. Um, Auckland Council does not have unlimited resources. Therefore, the suitability and performance of existing open spaces does need to be assessed. Um, there has been some discussion here about the adequacy or otherwise of the assessment criteria, uh, but these do form part of Auckland Council's overarching open space strategy. Um, if I could just quickly deal with um, some of the points raised on individual reserves, um, starting with Aberfeldy, um, I would just like to uh, note that there are no plans for light rail in Howick. Um, I believe that uh, the idea was mooted on the uh, Greater Auckland Transport blog uh, back in 2008 or 2009. Um, it is not part of the current plan. Um, all information on current light rail planning can be found on the uh, light rail website. Um, moving to 40 foot lane, uh, one of the submitters asked if good design principles were considered as part of the proposal to revoke the reserve. Um, 
I think he and I would um, have a lot to talk about on good design principles, uh, good urban design principles, uh, but these do not form part of the um, assessment criteria under the uh, Reserves Act. Um, lack of consultation. Um, I would simply note that uh, when it came to public notification, um, we have gone uh, beyond the requirements of the Reserves Act. Um, as for there are, are, are not receiving one proposal in favour of the reserve revocation, I would just simply like to observe that the public notices that uh, we put into the local press and on the website explicitly invited people to object. We did not actually invite, uh, we did not invite people to write in with fulsome expressions of support. Um, one submitter, uh, several submitters, in fact, invent, uh, mentioned um, no investments in in the reserve. Um, this was also a point raised for Golflands um, today. Um, I would suggest this is something that uh, probably should be taken up with the local board. The local board has the decision making powers for non regulatory activities, including um, investment in open spaces, um, that is to say, via um, whether it's putting in playing fields or children's playgrounds. Um, so they decide uh, when and where it happens. Um, I would also like to point out the, the reserve, um, Aberfeldy Reserve, none of these reserves were gifted. Uh, the reserves were vested on subdivision. Um, this was an obligation that was placed on the developer. It is not an act of altruism. Um, one of our submitters uh, said that we should be offering Aberfeldy uh, Reserve back to the um, back to the original owner. Um, there is no obligation to offer back reserve land that was vested on subdivision. Um, where there is an obligation to offer back uh, to a previous owner, we adhere to the requirements of the Public Works Act. Yeah. Moving on to Tiraco. Um, that's the two, the two uh, little plots next to the service station um, by Pacarang Plaza. Um, this is a local purpose utility reserve. It is not being used for that purpose. Um, the proposed greenway was mentioned um, and a plan was shown. Um, and I'd just like to point out that the proposed greenway on the Pakaranga master plan does not pass over the subject land, it passes alongside it. Um, Amity impacts the other side of Pakaranga Road and the land behind Pakaranga Plaza on Reeves Road. Um, AT have confirmed that um, land is not required for Amity and the Howick Local Board does not oppose the proposed reserve revocation. Uh, due to its size and shape, um, it could only be sold to an adjoining owner. That would be either the petrol filling station or uh, GYP, the uh, submitter that was objecting to the proposed reserve revocation. Uh, GYP are um, a logical and obvious purchaser. Um, moving on to Golflands, um, just a few points uh, not already covered in, um, in, in the previous reserves. Um, I would just like to note that um, Elim School, um, it's Ministry of Education land. It's not, it, was, it was not Auckland Council land, um, so it was, not, it was not a public reserve as such. Um, 28 Simon Owen Place is still owned by Auckland Council and is still a reserve. Um, and uh, yes, the, the, the lack of a playground, uh, this is a, a local board issue. Uh, that concludes uh, the comments I want to make on the um, on, on the Reserves Act. Um, just uh, to go through my colleague Anthony's notes regarding rationalisation and consultation. Um, I'll just note that um, in accordance with the Local Government Act, um, Council's governing body has the delegation to uh, to clear land for disposal subject to statutory requirements, um, as this is a, a regional decision. The views of the local board are sought as part of that process and are considered by the committee in decision making. Uh, the properties um, under discussion today were approved for sale in principle. 
subject to the completion of statutory processes, including reserve revocations, plan changes, local board and Manafenua consultation. Um, the council published in 2020 as part of its emergency budget um, a long list of properties which were being considered for disposal. Uh, this was intended to provide openness and transparency um, for in following criticism from some elected members and members of the public that the process was, was not transparent. Um, the consultation with the Howick Local Board, um, as mentioned by the Local Board representative, it actually included uh, organised site visits, a bus tour with senior council staff, workshop discussions and a report to the Local Board public meeting in August 2020. Uh, the board also provided further feedback at two other public business meetings and, um, was spo and spoke at this hearing. Um, at this hearing, the Local Board representative was critical of the fact that um, some of the proposed re reserve revocations were withdrawn um, owing to stormwater issues or infrastructure issues or the like. Um, he was evidently of the opinion that all the information uh, should have been in possession of the council officers conducting the tour. Um, I would just like to observe that the Howick Local Board previously requested that it be, be engaged with early in the process. Um, prior to um, the uh, consultation within council. I believe they actually passed a resolution to that effect. Um, there's not really much more I can say about that. Um, I would just like to say that uh, the, the, the head, uh, Eke Panuku's head of um, strategic asset optimization is also present at this meeting. So by your leave, I would just like to um, invite her to make um, any comments. That's fine. It's, uh... Ms Edwards, I take it. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, if I could respectfully just request that my camera remain off. I um, am at home looking after a sick child, and given this meeting is broadcast, I'd just like to respect my son's privacy while he's um, unwell at the moment. So apologies for that. Uh, look, just a couple of things to note, um, just following on from what my colleague Cal May has said. Um, the long list that was published in the emergency budget that was intended to provide oversight and transparency of what was being looked at on the back of um, criticism from elected members and local boards for a number of years that there wasn't early elected member um, participation and input into any properties that were being considered. Um, the long list was prepared to provide transparency, openness and oversight um, to the community about what was being looked at. Several properties um, were removed from that list once further investigations meant that uh, they were unable um, to be considered um, and they needed to be retained by council. Uh, some of these were, um, as, as was noted by the um, how a local board member, it was identified that there were stormwater issues and they needed to be retained and they have been um, retained on that basis. And as my colleague Carl mentioned, in engaging early with elected members, that means that we don't necessarily have all the um, facts to hand about the history and um, views of all, all parts of council, but it does enable that early feedback and input. Uh, the um, uh, just another um, thing to note is that um, yes, the um, I, I think Hal made this point. The um, initial disposal approvals were in principle, and it was uh, subject to the completion of all statutory requirements. Uh, that has included um, the. Re for these subject properties, the reserve revocation process. Um, no final decision has been made on the reserve revocation process. Um, and, and you're probably aware there was no obligation for us to have hearings, but given the large amount of public input, we, we felt it was very important that uh, there be independent views provided to the council's governing body in making their decision. And we are looking forward to being able to provide uh, your findings to the governing body to take into account as part of their decision making. 
uh, through this process. Just one other thing that I would like to note that with the um, signs on the reserves, when we started this process, we intended to put signs on the reserves um, immediately. We subsequently went into a um, COVID-related lockdown. This was um, early last year. Um, you may recall we had a couple of quite short, sharp lockdowns, but that impacted our ability to actually get signs prepared, printed, laminated and um, put on reserves. Due to that, we deferred um, or pushed out the timeframes that we were um, accepting public submissions and re-advertised it so that there was every opportunity um, for anyone who was interested in making a submission to make the submission. The intention was certainly there to get the signs on the reserves earlier, but um, our hands were somewhat tied given um, we went into, unexpectedly went into lockdown. Uh, I don't have anything further to add, but I am happy to answer any questions you may have, Mr Chair. Thank you, Ms. Edwards. Uh, just one question from me. The, um, in terms of these particular the reserves that we're dealing with here, um, and, the, and uh, as they were uh, forwarded for the emergency budget consideration, was there any additional information that came forward that wasn't available at the earlier decision point? For these reserves, no, I don't think so. I think um, it, it was council who prepared the report that went up to the Finance and Performance Committee um, on these properties. From memory, um, a lot of discussion documents actually went in there, so more information that, um, than would normally go in. And I think we saw a snippet of that yesterday. Of It, it was the... Um, all staff, everyone giving their view um, that, that a screenshot was provided of before um, a final staff decision had been made. So we do consult widely, um, when I say we, the council group, um, consults widely as part of that rationalisation process. And um, staff do have, many staff do have different views and there is a bit of a filtering of um what is often personal opinion and a, and a weighting of factors that takes place before any um, final decision is made. And yes, from memory, what went to the Finance and Performance Committee, and we can provide this to Julie, was essentially the um, the long form staff feedback that um, fed into part of that early decision making process. So. I can't think that there was, um, I can't think of anything that hadn't gone to the Finance and Performance Committee in making that in principle decision. Of course, uh, there is all the information and the submissions um, that relates to the uh, reserve revocation that will need to go to the um, Parks, Arts, Community and Events Committee as they have the delegation on the uh, reserve uh, about making a recommendation to the Minister of Conservation on the um, proposed reserve revocation. So that will all be going to the um, PACE committee, as we call it, um, along, um, of course, with your findings and recommendations. <clears throat> yep, um, thank you for that. Any no, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Edwards. Appreciate that. Um, Mr May. OK, thank you. Well, uh, I'd now like to call on my colleague, Mr um, Ezra Barwell, to um, address uh, some of the points around um, the assessment um, of the sites. Take it away, Ezra. Thanks, Mr Barwell. Uh, here. I'm uh, putting up a presentation. Hopefully you can you can see that. Yeah, no, that's good. Thank you. OK, um, and before I, I launch into that, um, I'd just like to build on um, the comments from um, uh, Ms Edwards um, regarding that, that um, sort of a council reaching its its um, reaching its decision. Well, I guess not a decision. It's it's the 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 the, the, res the all the input from the different different um, experts. Myself, myself, my team, myself, the policy team, the parks operations team. Um, we've all got slightly different views, we've all got slightly different areas of expertise and inputs and I think um, as was sort of highlighted with the Golfland Park um, assessment yesterday, there's a sort of can be a bit of a difference of view or potentially what appears to be a conflict of 
um, opinions potentially between the policy people and the operations people. Um, often the operations people don't have any idea, specific ideas of the of the usage of a particular park, um, and that's that's been a criticism from um, some of the submitters. And I, I think that's I think that's valid. Um, but I guess that's all part of a this process that this this particular thing we're going through now, this hearing, that provides that input and. Um, I agree with your your um, your statement earlier that you would like to look at the full list of information, the full reporting that went up to the Finance and Performance Committee. And um, I, I think if you look at that in its totality, the different inputs from the different different people, um, all the inputs you've had today, that will help you um, you know build up that yeah. picture and reach your your um, your recommendation. So uh, that's often a criticism. I've had it in plan changes where um, submitters are saying, well, you know, this part accounts or the regulatory part says something different to the corporate part. Um, and they sort of see that as a weakness. I, I seem to think, I, I think that's a strength that different people will have different views. And these processes, these hearings processes allow all those, the synthesis of all those different views and to, to come together. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll give my presentation now. So I was just wanted to, um, oh, I guess not one last thing before I go into this. I've annotated a copy of the um, of the open space provision policy, which I will um, um, send to um, Ms. McKee, which she can then um, share with you. Um, so this, I've just done some little extracts in here in this presentation and some. Um, maps of some of the sites. Okay. That's going to be very helpful, Mr. Barr. Thank you very much. Okay, so first off, this is an excerpt from the open space um, provision policy. So there was sort of some, maybe not confusion, but discussion about the different types of, of parks, the pocket park and the neighbourhood park. Now, there's a lot of words there. It's, it's not, this is lifted directly out of the policy, so obviously it's not um, in a really good format for this this sort of, um, you know, for putting on a presentation. But essentially, pocket parks are need to be small, you know, 0.1 to 0.15 hectares. They're, um, they're a, an addition to the, um, to the provision. So they're not actually measured in the provision. Um, when you look at a provision, a provision assessment of an area, they're not, they're not uh, counted in that. And they're only in the high density areas. So none of the areas we've been looking at a high enough density to warrant provision of a pocket park. The neighbourhood parks are, are really what we're looking at here. Um, so they're sort of 0.3 to 0.5 hectares and roughly, um, well, yep, yeah, so 0.3 to 0.5 hectares typically, and they're for sort of play space. They're the thing at the end of the street, the 400 to 600 metre walk, depending on the density, and um, they're, they're for day-to-day -day recreational needs. But that's just a set of a bit of a background. Now, this is how to measure something um, sort of correctly and really empirically, you would actually do a ped shed. You would um, use some sort of computer program to work out. And this is a, an indicate, a illustration of that. It's a little bit blurry. I'm, I'm sorry, that's, that's lifted directly out of the policy. That's the best thing I've got. Um, but because that's um, impractical often, um, the policy has a radial proxy which is used to measure walking distances. So for the neighbourhood parks in a, in a high and medium density, which is all the ones that we're looking at here, um, apart from um, the, the Sotton Beachlands, which was which you um, pointed out yesterday, um, they're all really within that, that 400 metre walking catchment and the radial distance proxy is 300 metres. We sort of ground, ground truth that looking at a range of different scenarios now, Obviously, it doesn't work everywhere. It, it's if there's a stream or a, um, a railway line or a motorway, that doesn't work. But but it's it works in the vast majority of cases to to be a good um, proxy for an actual ped shed um, analysis. That's just to, to let you understand how we do that. And moving on to Golfland Park. So there's Golfland Park. There, the centre of the slide, um, 
with the blue line around it, highlighted in the light blue. And these are the um, 400 meter walking catchments indicated by the, the red 300 meter um, radial proxies. So it's showing that there's actually a good um, coverage in that area. It, it's, not, it's not lacking in coverage. So from a purely, from the provision policy perspective, that, that it, it, it is um, not needed to meet that provision target. That's not to say that it's not needed. The community don't value it. It's just really looking at it from that pure policy, doing the ped, doing the, the 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 distance measures. There are other parks around that that, that meet that that provision target. So just looking at that, and that's that's very helpful. Can you just go back? Just go back. Just just looking at that one, and that's really what I was looking for, was because I thought you would probably have some uh, <clears throat> some aerial uh, with those on. So the only the only part of that, um, basically part of that community we're looking at there, is in that sort of should we say one o'clock to two o'clock area where 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 the, the uh, circles do not overlap. That's correct, but I did actually ground truth that with measuring with the, with the um, on the GIS, and given that those are 300 metres, that you've got 50 metres from either. Um, I mean, you've got a, you've got 100 metres from either side. So that's in this particular case, there are really no properties that are that are more than 400 metres walk from a from an open space, or yes, you know, they may, be, they may be just they may be just over 400 metres. I think. To, <clears throat> Just, can I suggest if you put if you put the the, the, the point of your uh, um, of, of your circle around no go 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 up to the right if you put the point of your circle up yet yeah, say at the the head of that uh, cul-de-sac there yes. where it hits the road I don't know what road yes up, up around there yes then I'm then I'm I'm figuring that in actual fact. You're not covering anything other than Golfland Park at that point. If you drew a circle at that point, wouldn't that be correct? And I'm not making any, any I'm not making a big deal of that. At no, the no, no, absolutely, that's correct. So Golfland Park would would then cover that off. But if you went yeah. from here up to Bob Charles Park here, um, it might be, you know, it's roughly for it may be a little over 400 meters. But the the reality. Is um, well, not the reality. That the, the policy says it's a target. It's not a. It has to be that. I'm just saying that there's, you know, there, there's there's wiggle room here. Um, it, it's, you know, I guess the question. The question is is whether the wiggle room should be in favour of of retention yeah. rather than the wiggle room's yeah. favour of disposal. And, and I mean, I'm not, I'm not making a judgment here. All I'm Absolutely. saying is. If the policy says this is this is you know <clears throat> this is our target, then then all I'm suggesting is that there is an area there which is not served by that target currently. Yes, yes, there's wriggle room, but 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 on strict policy, it's not served. That's correct. Yes. Yeah. That's all right. That's that's all. That's all I'm observing at that point. I'm not making no, I'm not, I'm not, no judgment call on that. No, no, you're quite correct. Um, that that's that's the problem with a with a policy that has you know we have the these um, radial proxies. I mean to do the proper ped shed analysis, you might find there's a couple of properties in here. Um, I you know I'm it, it will only be ten or twenty meters max that they're probably falling outside that. But you, you're quite absolutely. It's a good observation. Okay, so moving next to forty foot park. This is, um, I mean, 40 foot park is covered by the boulevard. It's covered by the um, land down at the esplanade here. Um, so th and so that, that area and even um, just outside the catchment, whoops, sorry, um, from a park, which I, I don't know the name of it. Sorry, it's just off the, off the bottom, off the bottom of the screen here below sort of to the uh, southeast of boulevard. So, and that's yeah. got a playground in it. So, um, you know, once again, that's that sort of, you know, that's, that's that these these are judgment calls. They're not, you know, and that's that's why we're going through this process. I think that you know that, that all the different inputs need to be 
put into the mix and and um, looked at independently all the different competing things. So, um, have you got any questions on that one? No, and, and I mean I think that illustrates it quite nicely because if you have a look at again the same area which is not covered by any of the four or five circles, which is <clears throat> which is sort of uh, uh, northeast of, of, of Forty Foot Park, that small area in there, then you would say, well. Do you retain a park simply because three properties or four properties um, haven't quite got within the metric? Absolutely. And when, that's, when you and frame that, that, the answer is pretty clear. That's the difficulty with this policy. I mean, um, I explained it at, at an earlier hearing um, regarding the rezoning. This policy is essentially an acquisition policy. It's not a it's not a disposal policy. The the, the right. policy is designed for creation of new open space networks in greenfield areas. Um, mm. So it's, it's, we're sort of using it in reverse to look if it was a new acquisition would be right. But to just to, to let you know, when we are actually preparing or developing new open space networks, there are often gaps. The circles don't yeah. necessarily overlap. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so, you know, that's not, that's not an, in and of itself, that is not, um, an unusual thing. Even in a new greenfield area, there will often be gaps because of physical barriers. Um, you know, just just a multitude of reasons. It's not always the fact that there's circles. You can't. You know, there's always going to be sort of gaps where circles don't overlap, or there's yeah, there's always little little nooks and crannies. Like okay, so um, I'll move on to Aberfeldy now. I think Aberfeldy, um, you know, I'm not going to get into a discussion about which part of Auckland's got more open space, or what, because I don't think that that's not a that's not a um, you know that's not a a useful um, direction to go in. But looking at that, um, I, in my experience, I've not really seen any area that had such an overlap and such. A proliferation of open space. I mean that there are there are really you know there are really no gaps there, or maybe you know one tiny little gap down here. But yeah. I think if you did a proper ped shed analysis, that just wouldn't that just would probably disappear. Um, yeah. You know th this is level this area down here um, on this cascade walkway. I mean that's a beautiful kick around area. Um, I, I once again this is a judgment call. This is what the policy says laying it out but um that's that's what this process is going to do take all the different views and come to a a recommendation so i i think some issues were raised or something came up about sipted now that's um I, and i don't think mr may didn't address that but the council didn't put that up we never put that up as a, or, or and Panuku never put that up as a reason to dispose of the of this uh, potentially dispose of Aberfeldy. It was in response to some submitters um, had something about health and safety, and I'm not aware of that. Mr. May might be able to um, you know, be able to add more detail around that. But this is lifted out of the policy once again, um, and that I've annotated or. or Put a link to this in the in the copy that I will share with um, Ms. McKee. So, when we're designing new open spaces, they're meant to be safe and welcoming. Once again, this is a bit wordy, and I'll just pick out the key the key things. So, applying crime and prevention through environmental design principles when investing in designing any open space, um, providing wide street frontage along recreational and social open spaces with street frontage on two or three sides. So. Now, with new parks, we want full street frontage on two or three sides. So that means that a lot of the legacy parks just don't cut it. it you know, when you assess them using this, they don't, they don't, um, they wouldn't, you know, they, they, don't, they don't pass this test. So encouraging passive surveillance from neighbours by using boundary fencing that is visually permeable and unobstructed. Now, there are rules in the unitary plan that actually um, prevent fences being over 1.4 metres, solid fences being over 1.4 metres high, or if they are taller than that, 
they have to be um, visually permeable, permeable above that 1.4 metres. Um, now, as I said, I don't know. Typically, um, it's typical to go to a park in an established area and people have one, you know, 1.8 metre paling, solid paling fences all around it. So there may be negligible um, surveillance happening there. I, and I've not visited the site, so I can't speak on that. You're going to do that. Uh, I think some of the submitters have said that there is passive surveillance there. So that's that's something to, to take into consideration. Um, and then there's another thing from the policy here about um, shapes of parks. So this, this sort of applies to um, Aberfeldy to a point. Obviously, the, the example um, there um, with the cross on it, I mean, Aberfeldy is not like that. It's not down a narrow, but it has got a, an L shape. So part of it is sort of hidden from the road. Um, but I think this is probably more, this is probably actually more applicable to 40 foot. Um, from an urban design perspective, um, something like 40 foot lane is just not, it's just not what would be looked at in a modern, um, you know, if that area was redeveloped, the park, we would look to place the park on a main, on one of the, on one of the, the, the roads around the area, um, probably with a northerly aspect or potentially a, a westerly aspect looking out over the sea, um, it wouldn't have it internally like that. Essentially, it's an internalised um, <clears throat> space that's not sort of readily visible to the public. Um, so I guess that's just giving you a bit of background. That, that That's what I wanted to just give a bit of context um, around <laughs> decision-making. Just picking up... Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm just picking up a slight contradiction here between, I think, what Mr May said in response to some submitters, that urban design was not a consideration. And yet here you're saying that urban design is a consideration. Well, it's not a consideration for us. This is about this is about the park, but we, when, we, when we're working on a, on a... As I say, this policy is designed for creation of new open spaces in a greenfield area, and when I'm working um, in that space, we're sitting around the table with with um, with healthy water, with stormwater engineers, with um, ecologists, with roading engineers, urban designers, um, and I know that urban designers would um, would not want this sort of thing either. They would want it on the main road. I'm not an urban designer, so that's not my area of expertise. So I can't provide urban design, urban design advice. But that is, in practice, what happens. So this, this is something we would never do. Um, urban designers would never would never do this in the future. You know, moving forward, we'd never do that now. Right. I mean, and so I mean that that's helpful because I mean that that helps me to make that distinction between acquisition and disposal on that particular point. So that's that's useful. So yes, I mean yeah, uh, uh, that's really the end of my presentation. So are there any other questions that um, that, that I could potentially address? No, I think that's going to be helpful. Mm -hmm. I hope that ends next. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, no, no. I mean, I think we've, we've obviously questioned on the way through, but and and, and we certainly look forward to your annotated copy on that one because I think that'll be uh, that'll be a further help. And uh, this conversation has certainly been helpful, Mr. Barbell. So thank you for taking the time to do that. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. So, Mr. May, is that the end of uh, formal presentations? Um, yes, that that uh, that concludes uh, the presentations. Um, I think just going just to um, go back to your point about there being a contradiction over the, the, the urban design principles. Uh, when I spoke about urban design principles, I was not referring to um, the design of a reserve. Um, I I took the submitter to mean um, the overall um, design of an urban area and of course what would actually go up on the reserve if the um, status is uh, lifted and the reserve is uh, then sold to a developer. Yeah, no, I was taking a slightly different view from that particular submitter. 
<clears throat> which was the whilst this might not satisfy only the forward-looking acquisition urban design principles, <clears throat> if the option in terms of an urban design consideration is between a park and a non-park, then, then probably the urban design would say an inefficient park is better than no park. That's, uh, that's really what I was taking from that. So no, that's fine. Um, now, we, uh, as I say, we called forward the, the earlier information, so thank you the, for, in advance for the provision of that. Um, we will leave the hearing open at this point in time until we've received that information, because we may in actual fact want to come back with a couple of other questions, but it's, uh, from what I'm hearing at the moment, I think that probably will be sufficient. But let me just, uh, yeah, I think, yeah. So we, 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 will, we will adjourn this hearing at this point. Um, once we've received that information, we'll determine whether we need to, to call forward any further information. And at that point, um, if that isn't the case, we'll, uh, uh, Julie will advise all the parties that uh, the hearing is formally closed and we'll move into uh, our recommendation report. So um, now that material from you, Mr. May, will come forward straight away. It may have already come forward. Um, Mr. Barwell, your information will come forward today, will it? Or has he already gone to lunch? Mr. Barwell, sorry, have you already gone to lunch? So, no, 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 no. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, sorry, sorry, Mr. Chair. I was muted. Um, no, I will forward it to you. I wasn't quite sure where it's I will forward it to Ms. McKee forthwith um, the moment you were doing during the hearing. Right. <laughs> right. It's, well, nearly, it's nearly Friday. <laughs> right. Thank you for that. Then in that case, uh, um, uh, let me just thank everybody who's tuned in and is still tuned in for your participation. We are adjourned now and we will advise you when we formally close. So thank you all very much. <laughs>